This is an extract from the Victorian Workhouse by Trevor May. And it's really, a, it's not start at the beginning, this is about staffing the workhouse, which, is, which I found very interesting. The responsibility for building the new workhouses and for staffing and administrating them fell on locally elected boards of guardians. They were often resentful of central direction from London, nothing changed there, and did their best to circumvent it when it proved irksome. Guardians were usually drawn from the class of farmers and tradesmen whose interest was to keep as close an eye on expenditure as possible. Provided that they possessed the necessary property qualifications, women were technically qualified to serve as guardians, but it was 40 years before the first one was elected at Kensington in 1875. They appeared in numbers only after 1894, and by 1909 there were over 1,200. Inevitably, their attention was often directed towards women's work and the care of children and the sick but they came to exert a great influence over the system as a whole. Working class guardians were uh, also appeared slowly, but it was not until 1892 when the property qualifications were dropped to the occupation of rented premises worth five pounds annually that workers appeared in greater numbers. It was in that year that George Lansbury and William Crooks, both socialist and the latter an ex-pauper, were elected in Poplar, where under their influence, innovations in poor law administration soon became into being. The key appointment which the guardians had to work was that of the master of the workhouse. And in the early years of the new poor law, the master was often seen as little more than a jailer for the principles upon which the law was based were those of punishment rather than rehabilitation. As a consequence, suitable candidates were frequently found amongst the ranks of former policemen or non-commissioned officers in the Army and Navy. Typical of such men was former Staff Sergeant Colin MacDougall, artilleryman and veteran of Waterloo, who was master of Andover Workhouse at the time of the scandal there. In 1880, Louisa Twinning, a workhouse reformer, pondered why the apartment appointment of master should not invariably have been given to a man of superior position, the post being one that requires great discretion and powers of government, such as we might expect to find in retired officers. She need not have looked far for the answer, for salaries were low, duties were tiresome, and there was no career structure, and until 1896 there was no right to a pension. The master was tied to the workhouse as much as the paupers themselves, if not more so. A guide to the management of workhouses published in 1870 noted that the master should devote the whole of his time to this, to the discharge of his duties, and he cannot be an efficient officer if he devotes himself to pleasures or even to duties away from the workhouse. The master could gain no professional qualification for none was recognised and better prospects of advancement were to be found by transferring to the prison services. In 1880, the master of a workhouse for between five and 600 inmates might earn £80 a year, whereas the governor of a prison for 900 prisoners could earn £600. Gosh. One qualification that a master was expected to possess was a wife, for it was standing and practice, standard practice endorsed by the commissioners in London to appoint a married couple as the master and mistress of the workhouse. For this reason, it was not unknown for an unmarried workhouse school teacher to seek a spouse for no other reason than to climb the occupational ladder. The role of the medical staff was crucial, especially as the sick and infirm came to compromise the majority of workhouse inmates. To comprise the majority of workhouse inmates. And in the 20th century, doctors and nurses came to provide the link between the workhouses and the hospitals into which so many developed. In 1842, 16 years before the Medical Act of 1858 laid the foundations of professional status for doctors, the poor law commissioners tried to insist that workhouse medical officers possessed a qualification 
in medicine and surgery. The work was poorly paid and at first doctors were expected to provide drugs and medical supplies themselves and it lacked prestige. Nevertheless, a newly qualified doctor might take on poor law work to supplement his earnings with private practice, while a more experienced physician might see such work as a means of keeping out competitors. <clears throat> the arrangements for the sick in the workhouse were originally rudimentary and nursing was placed in the hands of female inmates who might be rewarded with gin for performing some of the more unpleasant tasks, such as laying out the dead. Only the most <laughs> basic qualifications were laid down, but Article 165 of the Consolidated Orders of 1847 did state that no person shall hold the office of nurse who is not able to read directions upon medicines. Paid nurses, it's useful, paid yeah. nurses were at first rare, and in the 1850s, there was only 70 in the whole of London, compared with 500 pauper nurses. It was in this and the following decade that a supply of trained nurses became more readily available. It was also in the 1860s that the inadequacies of medical provision in workhouses came under close scrutiny, such as inspired by inquiries initiated by the Lancet. In 1867, the Metropolitan Poor Act enabled poor law unions in London to act individually or in combination to establish infirmaries separate from their workhouses. And in the late 1860s and throughout subsequent decades, both in London and the provinces, such building work was carried out either to extend the infirmary provisions of existing workhouses or to erect new workhouse hospitals. In 1896, not long to go, uh, nearly 59,000 pauper patients were being treated in workhouse sick wards or separate infirmaries. This was a pauper mm. uh, place, wasn't it? Yes. This one here, you mean? Uh, yeah. The one it was. yeah. I think so. Of lowly Where was that then? That was here. It was a pauper. Um... The workhouse the was workhouse. where the medical centres are now. Mm. You know the big building oh, that faces that, you when you go I, in? That's correct. That, that was the workhouse. That was the workhouse. That was the workhouse. I've often wondered what that yeah, building no, was and, used And for. this was the poor lunatic asylum. I know this was... Yeah, the, yeah I know yeah. this. That, no, that, that was oh, workhouse. that was the workhouse. Yeah. I never knew that. Yeah. Yeah. Of lowlier status than the workhouse, medical offers... Uh, um, start again. Of lowlier status than the workhouse medical officer was the poor law school teacher. The provision of education for pauper children, like the provision of medical facilities for the destitute in general, was seen by many to conflict with the hallowed principles of less eligibility. The view prevailed, however, that children could hardly be held morally responsible for their in indig indigence and that education might help to break the recurring cycle of destitution. Without education, the prospects of a pauper child were dismal. A workhouse visitor in the 1880s asked a small boy idling in the yard what he hoped to do when he grew up. <laughs> Move to the men's yard where I can do as I like, was the reply. <laughs> the problem was made serious by the numbers involved. Between 1834 and 1908, roughly one third of all individuals receiving poor relief were children under 16. And it was not until the very end of the 19th century that the proportion of workhouse inmates who were children fell below a figure between one-fifth and a quarter of the whole. Great strides were made in improving pauper education in the 19th century, many of them inspired by Dr James Kay, later J Sir James Kay Shuttleworth, who was an assistant poor law commissioner in East Anglia, Middlesex and Surrey. Though Kay Shuttleworth developed developments, although Kay Shuttleworth developments in both the curriculum and the training of teachers which he ex pioneered in poor law schools were extended to the mass of the country's elementary schools. The trend was towards educating children outside the workhouse either in poor law district schools or in the ordinary elementary schools. There were growing moves too to remove children altogether from the influence of the workhouse either by placing them in separate boarding houses by fostering them or in the case of orphans, by sending them for adoption. Even so, 
It was not until 1913 that the central authorities issued an order compelling the removal of children from the workhouse. Poor law school teachers, like other workhouse officials, led restricted lives. They were expected to supervise the children outside school hours and could not leave the workhouse except with the master's permission. Nor was their food any better than that of the paupers, for they received the same meals, only in larger, only in larger often inedible portions. Such a life must have been claustrophobic, but although there were inevitable instances of cruelty towards inmates, acts of kindness by workhouse officers were not unknown, especially to those such as the young and the old, who were thought least able to help themselves. Very interesting. Yeah. God, that was tough then, wasn't it? Fascinating. Well. I mean, you know, Dickens... It's really fine, like, well, not, not, all, this. not only in yeah. Oliver Twist, but in Our Mutual Friend, mm. there's a character in that. Do you, have you ever read Our Mutual Friend? No, yeah. I haven't. Betty, Hig- Betty, Betty Higgum, an old, la- an old lady, did she do anything rather than go to the, the workhouse? Yeah, yeah. 